Extraordinary things. Post high school. Uh, and the person that I'm going to have on today is defense attorney Raha Georgiani. And she's not just your, ev- your average everyday defense attorney. She only represents deportation cases. Is that right, Raha? That's right. And... She hit me up because she had a, a, a case. I don't want to say interesting because I think that's a little bit like kind of belittling. Um, a very important case. And when we talk about deportation, when we talk about immigration, there's always this like narrative of coming here the right way. And I don't, I don't necessarily. Uh, there's a lot that goes into when people say, quote unquote, the right way. Uh, a few months back, we had uh, Aviva Chomsky on who actually wrote a couple books about the history uh, of immigration. And, and I wanted to read this quote before we get into the interview. Illegality is the flip side of inequality. It serves to preserve the privileged spaces for those deemed citizens and justify their privilege by creating a legal apparatus to sustain it. Heightened panic about quote unquote illegality coincides with gr- growing global inequality and the dependence of the privileged on the labor of the excluded. Without any further ado, please welcome Raha George Johnny. Good morning. <laughs> thanks for having me on. Thanks for thanks for agreeing to come on. This has been a long time in the making. Right. So you have a very interesting case. Um, you are representing a young man. I said interesting again. You are representing a young man named Walter Cruz Zavala. Am I saying that right? Yes. Walter. And, and Walter yes. has two times won his immigration case, but he's still locked up. You know, and every time I hear someone else say that, it is just um, kind of infuriating. As it should be. That's exactly that's exactly right. Um, so there's a few things I want to get into as quickly as we can, as I know you don't have a lot of time. Um, mm-hmm. But there is this phrase that a lot of us hear, and I don't think, I don't too, think too many Americans actually know the definition of it. It's filing a writ of habeas corpus. Mm -hmm. And you were doing this work during the Obama administration, correct? Correct. Do you recall or were you doing this exact work when Chris Hedges had sued the Obama administration um, about the uh, National Defense Authorization Act in 2012, the NDAA, which kind of allowed the uh, indefinite... uh, what do you call it? Right. Uh, I don't want to say incarceration. What do you say? Is that is that is that the right word? Indefinite. I was. Yeah, it is incarceration. Immigration detention is definitely incarceration. That's imprisonment. Um, you know, people use the word detention to refer detention. To in civil immigration custody, um, and I think that gives people the sense that there's something less serious about it or it's shorter you know because it's a detention it's not a prison sentence and i think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that that quote-unquote detention can go on for years just like jail and prison can um i wasn't doing habeas corpus litigation in 2012 but Mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of folks were. And so going to, you know, going to federal court to challenge illegal conduct by not only the Department of Homeland Security, but also by immigration courts, which like the Department of Homeland Security fall under the executive branch. Um, that's definitely nothing, nothing new. Um, and that was against Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, and Mitch McConnell. Where the, mm -hmm. uh, and they all upheld that um, NDAA. And here we are now um, with your case. So can you tell us a little bit about your case? Absolutely. So and how you how how this came to your desk. Right. Um, I met Walter uh, when he was not in custody. I met him when he had filed his asylum application and we were sort of getting ready uh, for an asylum uh, interview with USCIS or, or DHS. And then he ended up in criminal custody um, on in a misdemeanor case. And when he posted bail on that misdemeanor case, he, rather than unlike a citizen who would have posted bail and been released, um, Walter was released to immigration authorities. So he was transferred to immigration custody. And we see that a lot uh, with our clients. We see that a lot of folks are essentially transferred from the criminal justice system or criminal legal system criminal injustice system to uh, immigration system. So Walter ended up in custody in July of 2017. That was nearly three and a half years ago. And what happened is that he ended up um, having his case heard before an immigration judge. We presented our case before the immigration judge. Our opponent, uh, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, presented their case before the immigration judge. And our claim was that Walter was more likely than not to be tortured if returned to El Salvador. And one of the reasons that Walter is um, afraid of returning to El Salvador is that he was gang affiliated as a child when he was uh, 16 years old, he joined MS-13. Um, he wasn't in the gang for very long, but ended up in custody as a result of that affiliation. Um, Walter ended up, uh, while in, in custody, being tattooed by an older gang member who ended up being a government informant. And so due to essentially the actions that someone has taken um, while being an agent of the United States, Walter now has permanent markings on his body that make him, uh, that endanger his life should he return to El Salvador. So he presented that case to the immigration judge and he won, except immigration law is nuts. And so even when you win, normally the person who wins sort of gets the benefit of having prevailed. But in uh, what I sometimes call upside down land, um, even if you win, if you're, the, if you're the immigrant and you win and DHS decides to appeal, you stay in to allow them an opportunity to appeal. So Walter stayed in custody for over a year. And when the appellate court, the Board of Immigration Appeals, uh, issued their decision, rather than make a final decision on his case, they remanded it. They sent it back to the immigration judge on a technicality. I'm going to spare your listeners what that exact technicality was, but it was a technicality. And when they sent it back down, um, the immigration judge who had granted his case was now gone. Actually, a lot of a lot of immigration judges um, left the the court, the San Francisco Immigration Court, um, right around then 2018, 2019. And so that judge was gone. Another judge stepped in, and that judge actually regranted Walter's case um, based on the findings of the first judge. So. The second judge used those findings and said, yeah, Walter is more likely than not to be tortured in El Salvador. Can you guess what DHS did after that, Jason? And they, they went ahead and said, F it. <laughs> they appealed again. Yeah. They were like, okay, you won again. We'll appeal again. And same thing. They appeal. It's not final. You stay in custody. So Walter stayed in custody for another year. And 
that decision, that decision came in July. So a couple months ago, we received a decision that shockingly sent it back, but this time not even on a, not even to cure a technicality, the court just sent it back and said, you know, just do the whole thing over again. And that, that is something that I have, I've done this work. I've done deportation defense work for about 15 years and I've never seen anything like that. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do something that I don't normally do because I do not know the game of basketball, but I'm going to borrow a beautiful <laughs> analogy. I, I told somebody what had happened and they were like, you know, that's, that's like if LeBron James had made a shot and Anthony Davis, no, you know what? I'm going to set up. Let me start again. See, <laughs> you know, I don't do basketball analogies. Like I don't do. Is that. there, is there any sport that you really do do an again. analogy? No, there's no sport. There's no sport. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Stay with me. Are you, are you ready? I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm ready. Sure. Okay. There's a game, okay, mm-hmm. and someone shoots a basket. And <laughs> in. Okay, mm-hmm. all right. Are you laughing because I said basket and not a ball? No, I'm just laughing at the the okay. now the oversimplification of the analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're getting somewhere though. Okay, so okay. so baskets in. have been shot. <laughs> the shot goes in, and we know that it was either LeBron James or Anthony Davis, mm-hmm. and rather than say hey they're members of the same team so the lakers win the refs Mm -hmm. you know what we can't tell who shot it and so just do the game all over again that doesn't make sense because because we know the lakers won and that's sort of exactly what happened with walter what has been clear twice now is that he has shown that he's more likely than not to be tortured in El Salvador. And when you make that very, very difficult showing in immigration court, you're supposed to be protected under domestic and international law. Um, And so there's no need to do the the game over again. Why do we need to do the game over again? Usually that happens if somebody fouls or someone makes a mistake. And in this case, nothing like that happened. And the crazy part is this is not a game. This is a man who's waited over three years to have some finality to his case, to have some resolution, to have some idea of when he walks out of that detention center, is it going to be to get on a plane to leave this country? Or is it going to be to end up back in San Francisco or Oakland? Where is he going to be? And that that sort of indefiniteness of immigration detention is what makes immigration detention so psychologically terrorizing is that it's not a sentence. It's not, it's not a period of time that you can wrap your head around. It's not a period of time that you can tell your family at the end of this three months, I will be home. Or even at the end of this three years, I will be home. I can't tell Walter as his attorney when he's going to be home, if he's going to be home and which where home is, right? And that's, that's, really, that's really incredible when you think about it. And does this have a lot to do with that NDAA from 2012? Like you can be held indefinitely. Um, that gets. Or is, a, it, or is yeah, this more like Patriot Act like, kind this of? This is actually no. This is actually you know it's funny. This is actually really truly basic immigration law. I mean, there there certainly they are related, but this is this is sort of how it's always been. We we the United States can civilly detain you while we figure out whether or not to deport you. And because we, we, the United States, cleverly um, classify that detention as civil, uh, it doesn't doesn't have the protections that the minimum protections that people have when their incarceration is criminal. So when you're in criminal custody, you have the right to an appointed lawyer if you can't afford one. Um, Under criminal laws, we have some, you know, we have statutes of limitations. For most crimes, you can't just be dragged into custody years after an alleged offense takes place. There's a period of time in which the government has to act. And if it doesn't act in that time, then that period is over. Um, We have Eighth Amendment protections against cruel and unusual punishment, right? The punishment has to fit the crime. There has to be some sort of proportionality of how long we can imprison you based on the conduct, right? So you have all these protections that when you when you take the 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 criminal, I'm putting criminal in quotes here, the criminal 
classification out and you replace it with civil, those protections are gone. Why? Because it's civil and we're not punishing you. And so that's just to, to just pause here for a moment. That's pretty intense to put somebody behind bars, shackle them, take them away from their family members, place them in custody subject to the same type of things that happen in custody when you're in criminal custody, and then tell someone, oh, wait, but don't worry about it because this is not, I know it feels just like jail. I know it feels just like prison, but that's not what we're doing to you. You're just in civil custody until we figure out whether or not to deport you. That's what's happening, and, Walter. And a lot of attention this year uh, came on the conditions of said custody. And in the press release you sent me, the conditions Walter were in was in was so horrible that he actually got COVID. There was a COVID outbreak um, in his facility. That's right. Um, but he's better now. He's better now. Um, but, you know, he describes it as one of the worst experiences he's ever had. He says he doesn't wish COVID on anyone. And it was really, really extremely frightening for him. He was terrified. He was terrified calling us not knowing, you know, what was going to happen. And frankly, that that terror is not necessarily over. We know from the research that's coming out that so many people end up with lifelong, long term consequences, mm -hmm. um, health consequences from COVID. There are folks who have, quote unquote, recovered, um, but can't work anymore. Um, can't, you know, go on jogs anymore um, and so on and so forth. So the scary part is we don't know, we don't know what the future holds for Walter. We just know that had this last illegal do-over order from the appellate court not happened, Walter would not have been in custody and he would not have contracted COVID. Like very, very directly, he contracted COVID-19 um, because he was in custody when he absolutely should not have been. And then when he found himself in custody, he couldn't social distance, which is exactly what all of the advocates um, and activists have been saying to jailers, that people should not in this catastrophic public health crisis, certainly not for a civil detention, um, be in custody uh, while this is all unfolding. Do you think things have gotten worse under this current administration when it comes to you doing your job? Like, are you, you said there was a lot of uh, judges that left, uh, immigration judges that left in 2018. Did that have anything to do with the Trump administration or was that just? Is that a trick question? I'm just <laughs> are you not allowed to answer that question? I'm going to go ahead and say that things are, <laughs> yes, much worse. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you're asking me about, about judges specifically, you know, I, I can't, I can only speculate. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't get a memo that says, you know, this judge, <laughs> you know, they, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm not, I'm not actually saying that sarcastically, actually, we should get a memo. I think that, it, I think that's, um, these are public servants and I think that's information that the public is, uh, has a right to know about, but we don't know why folks leave, but yes, I, we know several uh, immigration judges and even asylum officers who left um, and actually are some, many of them are now doing advocacy work. So one could one can infer um, might have left because they did not want to be a part of the violence um, that we have been seeing for the last several years. And, and I, I don't know, I feel like this year has been moving so slow that we've forgotten like these huge stories that broke. And I remember one of the big stories that broke that there was one of the, uh, was it an immigration office? Was it a border patrol office where their Facebook group had got outed, I think by the intercept. Mm. And they were saying just these horrible racist things. Um, they were sharing pictures of a, of a young of, of a man that was trying to cross in the water and he drowned with his daughter. And they were trying to say that they were calling him floater. Just this real kind of vile things. Do you remember that? Barely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not trying know, to block it out. I'm sure. I'm just, yeah. I'm just going to be real honest. I think uh -huh. one, of the, one of the craziest parts about being an immigration attorney and immigration defense attorney during this time is that, very, very much without any exaggeration, I can 
you that we receive um, news of changes happening on almost a daily basis that we then have to recalibrate to. So like, I'm talking about, mm. it's like from little things, you know, a, a form had, you know, a three, what used to be a three page form is now a 17 page form and requires you know, fingerprints to, you know, huge things like this entire whole remedy that used to be available is no longer available to our clients, or especially for folks like me who work with people impacted by the criminal legal system every single day seems to bring on um, a new attack on those folks, on folks impacted by the criminal legal system, which we know is heavily race-based and class-based. And so for people who have been in that system, the, the categories, the endless new categories of, you know, if you've been convicted of this, you are no longer eligible for that. If you have even committed, um, XYZ offense, you're no longer uh, eligible. If someone says you committed XYZ offense, you're no longer eligible. That stuff is happening on a daily basis. And I, uh, at some point, decided that for my own sanity to be able to continue doing this work, I was going to, um, I just can't take in all of the, all of the crazy news that comes in. I just need to focus on the clients who I'm responsible for advocating for. Mm -hmm sort of keep keep her steady and just go forward that way oh that's heavy uh we we had a we had a talk the other day before before we decided to do this uh do this call and one of the questions that i that i kind of made sure was okay for me to ask you is why do you do this work and and i say that because I wouldn't say it's a thankless job and when you're on the front lines I'm, I'm sure you definitely um the people that you are able to help you know it's a good feeling when you're able to help people i've, I've worked on the front lines with the unhoused so i know what mm -hmm. that's like when you're able to 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 help somebody over a hurdle right absolutely um that being said the beat down you get <laughs> uh, emotionally because I think to do this work properly, you have to be really in it emotionally as well. I don't, I don't think you can just kind of try to dot I's and cross T's and, and, and not take it home with you. You will always take this stuff home with you and, and having this conversation and hearing the tone of your voice, I can tell that this is something that is, is uh, like you're, you're physically appalled by mm. what's going on to, to, uh, to Walter. So what is it for you that even made you say, you know, I have this law degree, I could go work for an insurance company or, some big firm, make some real money, and then donate to these people. Like, what made you go, nope, nope, I'm going to be on the front lines because they need me? Yeah, I appreciate that question. You know, I think um, I think it's a lot of things. I mean, one one part of it is that I, I didn't go to law school to get the law degree and then just, you know, try to figure out what I'm going to do with the law degree. Mm -hmm. um, I went to law school uh, because I wanted to get some sort of degree that could allow me to sort of jump into the fight. Um, I think I, I think that I'm drawn to I'm drawn to a hard a hard fight, if that makes any sense, uh, for better or for worse. Um, and this was a way that I thought that I could uh, heavily, heavily get involved and potentially, you know, make a difference. And frankly, on a very selfish level. Um, I think when you do direct service, it may not be, you know, millions of people, but even just, even just providing assistance to that one person, one becomes two, two becomes 10, 10 becomes a hundred. Um, these are not huge numbers, but I'm going to be real honest about the fact that there's, there's a very, um, that's, there, there's something very fulfilling about that, that I think folks who are doing more, uh, macro level work, that don't get to see those immediate results, you know, there's another strength that it takes to do that work. Um, 
but yeah, the, it, there, there is a beat down. And I think that to withstand the constant beat down, you have to emotionally, politically, psychologically, you have to really truly believe from some very deep place um, that you're doing what you're doing for a reason. You have to believe in that reason. And I think for me, I, I truly believe that none of us are free until all of us are free. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think ultimately I do this work, uh, to get free. Basically. I think that, you know, a lot of times when, when you hear about, when you hear the work described, right. Of a person that's trying to get somebody out of custody, uh, our general society or, or mainstream media will put on the one side people who want to try to get people out of custody. And then on the other side, people who are concerned with public safety. And I don't see it that way at all. I actually think that I do this work because I'm concerned about public safety. Um, because I think that public safety is born out of healthy communities. I think that it's not born from a society that uh, gets off on all, finding all, all the ways to punish and punish and punish, to cage people over and over again, to separate them from family members, to separate them from their livelihoods, to separate them from their from you know fulfilling their potentials. I think that's not a free society. That's not a healthy community. Um, and that doesn't make us safe. And so I see the work that public defenders and removal defense attorneys doing as actually the number one way to address public safety, right? By addressing uh, communities and what communities need and how what how we can bring communities together rather than you know, disappear people one by one from those communities. And the other reason I think that I do this work is that I, for me, the story of immigration does not start <laughs> from the point where somebody comes into this country, whether, whether, you know, with permission or, you know, quote unquote, without permission, right? The story actually starts, um, as far back as what has happened in that country. Mm -hmm. I live in the United States. And the country that I live in has been responsible um, for all kinds of interventions and wars that have altered the course of the lives of people in other countries. And I actually, I, I think it's my responsibility as someone who lives here um, to know that and to understand that people leave their homes a lot of times based on things that we have done in their homes, right? I mean, to 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 simplify it in in the greatest terms, it's you know you you can't go to somebody's house and tear down their house and pollute the water um, and take all the food and take it to your house, and then when they want to come to your house to survive, you all of a sudden have a problem with that. <laughs> I mean, just like it's sort of like it's a good kindergarten, analogy. we learn to share like let's go back to kindergarten principles and let's make our foreign policy based on that um i think i think we wouldn't could, it be nice wouldn't it be nice if we could just so so yeah i think i think you know that that's where the story starts that's where the story starts and if you if you're paying attention to that then there then there's nothing left to do but feel compelled um, to, uh, help folks fight what's happening right now. It's, it's, uh, are you a person of faith at all? Hmm. You know, not exactly. I mean, I guess it, I guess it, it depends on what kind of faith I have. I have faith in, in nature and I have faith in energy and I, um, I think you, you put out energy and you get energy back. You have to have faith in something. I, my faith. I, de I definitely, yeah, yeah. again, working with the 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 homeless, unhoused, mm -hmm. um, has reconnected me with some sort of faith because I think you have to have faith in something, right? Uh, because the work is so, as the work you're doing, it's it's um, what's what's the what's the word I'm thinking of, um. For every little victory, <laughs> there's there's all these huge setbacks. As you say, every day you get a new a new setback, if you will. Right. As we try to criminalize the existence of these people that we 
we kind of created the United States, this, I don't like to use the word crisis, but this made up crisis of yeah. these people fleeing their homes. And we never really take into, into consideration that if you're walking thousands of miles for the chance, right. maybe the conditions where you are are pretty effed up and we should look into the conditions of where you are. Exactly right. Uh, even Geraldo Rivera, of all people, <laughs> who has been a shill for the right for some time now, uh, even he had to like stop his right wing shilling and say, look, man, these people literally walked 2000 miles. They're not coming from where you think they're coming from. Right. You know, and I believe the first wall that was put up was during the Clinton administration. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Clinton administration, you know, the up until the last few years, I mean, yes, the last few years has been, a, you know, new levels of insanity. Um, but that aside for a moment, the majority of my career uh, has been devoted to fighting the, you know, hum basically the impact of laws passed during the Clinton administration on families and in individuals and communities. That's that's absolutely the case. Uh, you know, even a, even before um, the current administration, people would ask me, oh, so, you know, 9-11, right? Is that is that when things got tough? And I always go back to nope. It was it was numerous laws passed by um, by the Clinton administration in 1996 that have given us, for the most part, the draconian uh, system that we have today. Tough on crime. Tough on crime. I mean, we, we forget tough on, crime, tough on crime while committing crimes. Like, we, yes, we, the United States can commit crimes and have, you know, little to no accountability for them. But then two, two minutes later, we really were all about, you know, not committing crimes. That's, I think the part uh, where, where this is, where it breaks down. And we also know. we, as us citizens can pretty much go anywhere we want. Absolutely. And, how and I think we forget that. that. That's our whole, our, our entire, our identity, right? As, as folks in the United States, as people who have the privilege of, of vacationing and touring and, you know, changing up our, our, our situations and experiencing new things. So the, the ironies keep, you know, adding up here. Like when you think about uh, getting a passport, as a, as a young person. And I, I don't know if, uh, if your class had some of those same people that like got to go to Europe when they graduated high school. Yeah, that's right. Um, my class definitely had some of those, those cats. Um, but th there's something to be said about like your family giving you a passport and being like, this is your key to the world. <laughs> and our neighbors in the Americas don't have those same freedoms. Mm -hmm. And when you have a president, and this is going to come out after the election, who knows who the next president is. Mm -hmm. But when you have a president that literally comes out and says things like, well, we don't get their best. It, it reinforces this feeling that this is this great, like the, the meritocracy, the, the, uh, the, the lie of American exceptionalism, that we are just the greatest place in the world. And these people want to come here because they want to be part of just this, this great team. Yep. Team America. Team America. And, and not that um, our private corporations have like pillaged. <laughs> Since the turn of the century, um, we've been so disconnected from an educational level of, of important things like the Monroe Doctrine that now ousted John Bolton. I remember him saying uh, a few years ago before he got the boot um, that, that he doesn't want to make the Monroe Doctrine a bad word anymore um, when they were talking about trying to invade Venezuela. So as we look at cases like Walter and we, we have to ask ourselves, well, why would this man, this young person leave El Salvador? Why would his family leave El Salvador? Right. We have to go back and look at the dirty wars in Central America, the death squads in El Salvador. You're exactly right. And the, the, 
the thing that really sticks out about Walter's case is that, you know, just like just like everything we've talked about here today, the details matter, right? The story matters. How we got here matters. Where you start the story matters. Um, but in Walter's case, it should be even easier because so many things that have happened to Walter have happened on our watch as well, right? We we essentially Walter ends up in the juvenile justice system, and we don't have um, we don't have the right programs in place to dissuade him from continuing to be to be part of a gang. You know, Walter joined the gang. Uh, out of a condition of powerlessness. That's what one of our experts said who we ha- who evaluated Walter, that, that children join gangs out of a condition of powerlessness. And we could have helped, you know, undo that or given him the resources that he needed to not feel so powerless. Walter himself says over and over again that based on all of the violence and trauma that he had dealt with um, up until, you know, 14 years of age, he just... He didn't want to be a victim anymore. He couldn't do that anymore. And he thought this was his way out of victimhood. Um, And so, you know, he ends up joining this gang. And within a couple of months of being an adult gang member, literally, that's how long he was a gang member. That's what we're talking about here. A couple of months, um, his first couple of months as an 18 year old, he ends up on the street in San Francisco. And it turns out that that is exactly the time that the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco is building a huge case, federal case against MS-13. And even though he's only been, you know, part of the gang as an adult for all of a couple of months, he's swept up into that, um, right? And he's tattooed by a government informant. They they could have sent, sent in help, right, at that point. They could have sent in um, an adult to help Walter. And instead they sent in someone twice his age to permanently mark him, um, to permanently give him this identity of being, being part of MS-13. And then they pick him up, they put him in custody. He fights his case for three years from the age 18 to 21 while in solitary confinement. Um, we know that that should not happen to an 18 to 21 year old. We had the science then, and we certainly have the science now to know the kind of damage it does to subject someone to solitary confinement, frankly, for for any period outside or greater than two weeks, let alone three years, let alone doing it to someone who, um, who is in that period where, you know, they're, they're doing all of their growing They're They're, it's this formative period in their life, right? 18 to 21. So we did that. We did that to Walter. Um, and then he gets out of custody and he picks up a drinking problem and the drinking problem leads you know, to misdemeanor after misdemeanor after misdemeanor. And those misdemeanors land him in immigration custody. Um, so I think part of this story is not just, it's not just about Walter's actions, right? Um, it's about our actions. It's about how we treat young black and brown men um, in the United States and and then and then and then how we respond when they respond exactly as we should expect and and it, for me that begs the question uh, what does a just society look like because I think where we went to school we went to school with some people that definitely did some things in their youth drinking and driving, Mm -hmm. drugging, God knows what else. And it kind of got waved off as youthful indiscretions, right? Like they're just being young. It's just kids being kids. That's right. And if you do those same things, one city over, maybe two cities over (laughs) in, in, in Richmond, well, now you're a threat to society. And you're a felon. And we have to suspend you. We have to expel you. If your parents don't have means, you know, we just recently saw Philadelphia has erupted in in violence because the police shot a a mentally ill man in front of his his mom and his his children um, when he was having a, a breakdown. Right. And... When you have means, you can you can get help. 
That's right. And you're never deemed a threat. That's why that exactly. That's why that. That's why the public safety conversation is one we really have to be careful about because you know people throw those words around, um, and then it just sort of shuts down the conversation. Oh, it's for public safety. Got it. Okay. Oh, okay. That's what public safety requires. Okay. I guess we better do it. And you know, I think we need to challenge who 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 is the public that we are keeping safe because there were never mm-hmm. any meaningful attempts. Um, to keep Walter safe, uh, despite the fact that we had a duty to do that. And so, yeah, I, that's, and, you know, we, we've seen all of the the studies that have come out just to your point about how folks in power view um, children, <laughs> black and brown children, and how literally, you know, you show, you show a picture of a, uh, you know, nine-year-old um, black kid and a nine-year-old white kid to a cop. And more often than not, uh, if the cop has to guess the age of that, of that child, they'll guess the age of the boy of color is older, right? And the, and the white child is younger. Like we, we attach implicit bias, we attach culpability um, to young children of color in ways that we do not do to white children. And that colors our responses um, to their, as you put it, youthful indiscretions. It, it, and, and this hits home for me uh, because I lived for a time with a white family that was not my own. And they had a son who had a bit of a break breakdown. And, you know, it's scary When your child snaps mentally, but what's interesting is the levers of help that you can pull when you have health care, number one. Number two, when you know your kid's not going to be deemed a threat, you can do things like call the police and put an APB out on your child and know that your child is going to be brought home. Maybe at the worst have to sit down in a, in a, in a mental facility for 72 hours, but ultimately they're going to be unharmed. And it's infuriating to me because when I, when I'm reading your, your, release that you sent me, uh, for Walter and I'm, and I'm hearing you tell the story and I, and I go over what I physically got to see. I got to see a young man that faced some similar, had some similar trauma in his life, but because he had a dad, had a good job, had good health care, He could go see a professional, right? He get medication. He's doing great. My brother is doing great. <laughs> he's, 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 he's married. He has a wonderful wife. Every time I see him, I just gush. I'm getting misty just talking about this. But it's also frustrating because, and he understands this as well, if he didn't have that, he could be Walter. He could be that young man that just got killed in Philadelphia. Absolutely. And and that's why this case for me, when you when you sent it to me and, and when I when I finally got to read over it, it definitely like really, really hit me and really touched me because it's it's uh it is what I want this show to be, to constantly ask the question, what does a just society look like? If Cornell West says, uh uh justice is what love looks like in public Hmm. then how can we call ourselves a just society when we criminalize this young man the moment he got here he wasn't deemed worthy that's right and you know i think one of the ways that we do that is to tell the truth And 
I think especially under this current administration, we have gotten worse and worse and worse at telling the truth. <clears throat> when we have raised the issue to the Department of Homeland Security of Walter's prolonged detention, of the psychological impact on someone who, you know, was picked up at the age of 27 and just celebrated his 30th birthday now, um, a couple months ago in detention, when we've raised the humanity or rather inhumanity of that situation, the response we've received by DHS, and I don't mean, you know, response that I'm uh, paraphrasing here. I mean, the exact response in, in English, in writing, on paper <laughs> that we have received is that Walter, Walter chooses to remain detained. That by fighting his case and appealing his case and essentially not giving up, um, that he's choosing detention and that he can end it. He can end it whenever he wants um, by signing, you know, the papers and, and, and giving up his case and going back to El Salvador. And that's really something, right? That's, that's I've said, it, it's like torturing someone on the edge of a cliff and telling him all he has to do to stop the pain and suffering is to jump. That's, that's our, that's our government's uh, rationale. It's obscene. That and it's not a fair, it's not a fair fight, right? If Walter, you know, Walter is right now every day grappling with um, whether or not he should give up and go, we didn't, we didn't finish uh, the whole story, but essentially when the appellate court told the, told the immigration judge a couple of months ago, just do it over, um, the message, the implied message there, uh, and I, I'm happy to, you know, stand corrected if anyone else can come up with any other implied message that, that, that an appellate board could be sending when twice, rather than adjudicate the facts of a case and make a final decision, every time it's a win, they send it back. The implied message is do it over and this time deny it. And that's exactly what the, the latest immigration judge did. So three, nearly three and a half years into this man's detention, he is now not the prevailing party. He now has a decision from an immigration judge saying that he is not more likely than not to be tortured in El Salvador based on the same exact evidence that was twice used to find that he is more likely to be tortured. And now he's the losing party. And now he has to start his appellate process all over again. And so what I've had to tell Walter is that unfortunately it could be years before he actually gets a final decision in this case that he knows and I know that what happened to him is illegal. And we think that once we get this case before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, we'll win. We will win this case. Um, but in order to get there, he has to give up two or three more years of his life, which, which frankly, I don't even know that ethically as an attorney, I can even recommend, right? Because to recommend that to him, I have to believe that there's a, there's a somewhat of a you know, working justice system. And the sat, and unfortunately I can't give him that guarantee and I'm, I can't make that recommendation. So he has to figure out whether it's worth gambling, you know, age 30 to 33 to maybe, maybe get the right decision eventually and get out. So if Walter gives up in the next couple of months, the Department of Homeland Security wins, right? but they didn't win because they made the best argument. They won because they essentially created so much pain and suffering that this person had to give up a completely meritorious claim, a winning claim um, to go. And, you know, none of this has ever been fair, but that's especially unfair. So let's say... Two years pass. Walter's like, F it. I didn't do anything. 
and I'm not going to go back to El Salvador. I can't go back to El Salvador. It's a land yeah. I no longer know. Yep. <clears throat> um, let's say, and let's say you win. Do we change a precedent at that point to to maybe change things, or is the next conversation uh, on a bigger level? How do we dismantle the DHS? <laughs> <laughs> much like you hear abolish ice like is that the next chant that we yell out i think it is about dismantling violent systems that are not making us safer and that are not um giving our communities health um which is i i honestly can't think of another uh a, a goal that makes more sense than that for a government agency to have. Like why, why are, why is that not the goal of all of our government agencies to produce health? That just seems like it makes nothing but sense, right. For, for a government to devote all of its resources to doing. Um, so I think that is a different conversation in terms of precedent. I, I think I understand what you're asking, but essentially the fight that's happening in the immigration court and the Board of Immigration Appeals, and hopefully, eventually, uh, Walter sticks it out and gets to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. That I don't know that that, that could actually set precedent because we the court would have to decide whether it was legal to just, without pointing out any errors in the lower court's decision, to just order a redo. Right? Can a just redo? Just call for for a whole game to be redone without saying pointing out anything that was wrong with the, with the original game, basically. So I think we could see some precedent there, good or bad. I'm hoping good. But the other thing is that while Walter's case winds up through those courts, we have gone to a separate court. We've gone to the U.S. District Court, and we have essentially sued. Um, that's essentially what a, what a petition for writ of habeas corpus is. Um, essentially, we're saying that the Department of Homeland Security's conduct of continuing to detain Walter and the immigration judge's conduct of continuing to find him to be a danger to the community, which is what is ultimately keeping him in custody right now, um, that those are those are illegal decisions. And they're illegal because Walter's, Walter's detention has become punitive. And what I had set up in the beginning of this, um, of our conversation about civil civil detention versus criminal detention. Because this is a civil detention, technically, legally, we're not supposed to be punishing Walter. It's not a, it's not a, he's not serving a sentence. This is not a punishment for a crime. He has misdemeanor convictions and he has served his time for all of those misdemeanor convictions um, and felony convictions. He ha he's, he's done his time, right? So he's done um, with those. Yet he remains in custody based on a finding of dangerousness using those prior convictions that he's already served his time for. So right now, Walter has been in civil immigration custody um, based on these convictions for eight times longer than the longest period he's served on any one of those convictions. Right. It's 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 beyond anything that is that can can be said to be rational. Um, and when your detention becomes irrational, if you will, um, it becomes punitive and excessive, and then it becomes unconstitutional. That is sort of a a bolder argument <laughs> or an mm -hmm. argument. Um, at least in, in my career, it's 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 the first time that I'm alleging that the the nature of the detention itself has inherently become excessive and punitive. And for that reason alone, you have to immediately release this person. I don't know what's going to happen to that lawsuit. It's pending now. We're in week four. We're still waiting for the court to respond. Um, so yeah, we could be, we could see some precedent there. Well, um, did I get too legally? No, no, not at all. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. Um, so I worked in the Gulf of Mexico for a time on oil rigs, and it was a very um, cu culture shock is, is an understatement. Uh, but I cooked and I and all the eggs were to order. And I remember I just was in the weeds and everybody was yelling at me about 
what they wanted and how they wanted it. And I was doing it wrong because I was from California. And the main, the main head chef guy walked in and he looked at me and he's like, you know what your problem is? You're not doing this with passion. He's like, every egg you flip in here, you flip that punk ass egg with passion. <laughs> and listening to you speak, I, I know that. you do this job with passion. So, oh, I appreciate that. What can we do to help Walter? <laughs> well, definitely vote tomorrow if you haven't voted already. Um, I think at this point, it's really about uh, uplifting this story and telling this story over and over as many times as possible. Um, I mean, if folks feel particularly brave. It's the the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco is the prosecutorial agency that is defending the Department of Homeland Security um, during this litigation. So, you know, pay attention to, to who we elect as a prosecutor, put pressure on your, technically those are your local prosecutors. They are federal. Um, would that be, would that be ASA? Uh, it would be the U S attorney's office. So oh, the U S attorney's office. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. They're often, they're often referred to the AUSAs. I was thinking of uh, um, the San Francisco district attorney. Oh, Chesa. Yeah. yeah, Chesa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Chesa. No. So he's, he's local. So that my bad. Right. So that would be if Walter was being charged for a state crime. Um, But these are, these are federal attorneys that work for the U S department of justice. Um, So they take their orders from, from our attorney general of the United States but they are still they're they're in San Francisco. They are supposed to be acting right um, on behalf of the United States, which includes all of us. Um, they're supposed to be acting for us. And so I think you know if folks want to find ways to get involved to put pressure on them, um, especially the the attorneys in the civil division who uh, defend DHS whenever there's litigation about detention or detention conditions or length of detention, I think it would be good for them to hear um, from, from our local communities about what, what types of values we want uh, them to exemplify or not. Um, But on a more, on a more basic level, just, just share this story and talk about Walter because the only thing worse, you know, than him having fought this entire time and ultimately giving up and going um, is for all of this to have happened without people knowing what, what, how we treated this young man and his case. And you're going to give me a link to the U S attorney's office in SF so I can put it up for people to contact him. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for making space for this conversation. I really, really do appreciate it. So does Walter. Well, tell Walter that I said, what's up? And I hope he's doing well. Can I send him anything? Is he allowed to get packages at all? Yes, sir. Okay. We'll try to find a list of things that Walter needs and likes, and we'll see if we can, we can help him out. So he's an amazing artist and we're hoping that at some point, um, I'm just going to go ahead and say when he gets out, um, Mm -hmm we can actually have him do some art shows in the community. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And actually by saying, you just reminded me that I need to, uh, I've been tasked with a very important mission of finding an Iron Man toy to send to Walter's six year old son. Do you have any suggestions? I do. I will, I will, I have a ton and, uh, because I am myself, uh, have the childlike love of a six-year-old for all things uh, action figure. So this is perfect. So I'm going to find some things and I'm going to send them to you and be like, if you were six, which is a better gift? I will be more than happy to answer those questions for you. Perfect. Great. So don't hang up. I'm going to play some music. Don't hang up. All right. All right.
Thank you guys so much for taking the time to check out the show. Thank you, Raha, for taking the time to share this very important story with us. Uh, in the description of the show is an address where if you guys would like to send Walter some letters of support, the address is there. Please do it. I'm going to do it. I encourage all of you guys to do it. This man has been incarcerated for two years after winning his case twice. Looking at another, or three years, I'm sorry, looking at another two years. So let's send him as much uh, support as we can. Also is the U.S. Attorney's Office where we can send them letters of our disgust um, and tell them what we think they should do. Please free this man at least until he gets his trial. You you heard Raha say that there are even uh, uh, parole officers that are willing to give him an ankle bracelet just so he can not be locked up and the man has caught COVID inside of the facility so thank you guys once again uh, please like share and subscribe especially on the YouTube we really appreciate some more subs on the old YouTube and if you guys can please become a patron we are working out some patron only programming there's going to be more patron only shows So please become a patron. This is listener supported. Thank you guys very much.